Hi, I'm in the highlands of Papua New Guinea right now, and today we're going to talk about figs. Now when people say fig, typically they mean only one species of fig, which is the one used for eating. And while I don't have any of those right around here, fortunately there's over 800 different species of fig out there, all in one genus, Ficus, and a few of them grow wild around here. So let's look at those. This genus is very diverse, but all of the species carry a few of the same characteristics. And the dead giveaway with these is the flowers and the fruit. See, figs have a very unusual type of flowering structure called a syconium. And from the outside, it doesn't really look like a flower at all, to the point that a lot of people think figs don't flower. In regular flowers, the two most important parts are the stamen, or the male parts of the flower, and the pistil, the female parts of the flower. The male parts are the ones that produce the pollen, and the female parts receive this pollen and use it to fertilize one or more eggs which will in turn turn into seeds and fruit develops around this in various ways depending on the plant. In some plants you see male and female parts in the same flower sometimes on separate flowers but it's always the female parts that develop the seeds. So where can you see all this on these flowers on the fig? Well the unusual part you've got to cut it open to see them. When you open up a fig to eat it you'll see a lot of strings of fruit with seeds at the end and each one of these is actually an individual fruit that used to be a female flower. And these are the tiny female flowers, and the male flowers tend to be right here next to this hole. So what's the whole idea with this oddly shaped flower? Well, figs are pollinated by wasps, and not just any wasps, but this particular group of wasps called the fig wasps. And these wasps have a pretty fascinating life cycle. Hi, so this is Sam editing this three years later. Why am I still editing it three years later? That is an excellent question that I don't think I can fully answer, but in any case, I ran into a problem here in the process. I recorded myself here talking all about fig wasp life cycles, but it turned out afterwards I had no way to show what I was talking about. Fig wasps are pretty tiny and hard to photograph, and not having got any photos myself, I could find almost no pictures or video I could use online either without either paying lots or having minimal scruples about the legality of their use. But removing this section from the video left some nonsensical gaps in the narration, so here's the short version of what I was going to say. A young blooming fig, so the insides don't look like this, they look more like this, female fig wasp comes along covered in pollen and crawls in this tiny hole in the end, losing limbs in the process, pollinating the female flowers and laying their eggs inside. The baby wasps hatch and grow up inside the fig. Males mate with females, chew a hole in the wall, and die. The females leave through the hole, getting covered in pollen from the male flowers, and fly away to find another fig to pollinate, lay their eggs in, and kick the buckets themselves. As you can imagine, this is a very precise process, and there's a lot of little details that need to match between the fig and the fig wasp. The timing of its fruiting and ripening, so females can find another fig to enter soon after they emerge and not just, you know, die instead. You have the shape and the smell of the fruit to attract these specific insects, the size of the opening. So these relations are very specific. There's over 800 species of fig out there, and for many of them, there will be one or maybe a small handful of fig wasp species who this is the only fig they go to to spend their whole life. And this wasp is the only thing that pollinates this tree. They're fascinating examples of symbiotic relationships, and maybe someday I'll go more into this, but for now, I leave it for others with a bigger budget for cinematography than I. So, back to the video. And that's really important, because a lot of fig species are keystone species within their particular environment. And that means that a lot of living things either depend on them for survival or depend on something that depends on them for survival. In this particular case in the highlands, a lot of this goes as food towards insects, birds, bats, and other mammals like bandicoots. For some of those, they can go quite a while eating pretty much nothing but figs when the figs are in season. So it's really important that the trees stay around. So this fruiting structure is something all the ficuses have in common, but the ficus genus is a huge one with a lot of diversity so let's take a quick look at some of the different species of fig I could find here in the highlands of Papua New Guinea. Unfortunately, I wasn't able to find specific species names for a lot of the species of fig I found here, because Papua New Guinea is 
still one of the least explored places on Earth, and information and pictures of species can be pretty hard to come by. But if anyone happens to have a guess, by all means comment that, I'll, I'm glad to hear that. But anyway, this one's kind of locally famous as one that works well for making toys. You get these little round figs that children around here often use to make cars, sticking a bunch of them on a rod, and then a few more as wheels. You can kind of see the shape there. One thing we can guess about this fig, though, is that it's probably eaten by bats. Now, I can't say this with full confidence, as there's been very little actual scientific observation of bat species and their interactions with figs here. But different types of figs will rely on different animals to eat their fruit and spread their seeds. And if you're targeting a different animal, chances are your fruit will also look fairly different. And so the two biggest groups that figs tend to aim for are either bats or birds, which both look for different things in a fruit. If a species of fig is targeting bats, generally color doesn't matter so much, since it doesn't really need to stand out visually in the daytime. So you'll see a lot more fruits that are green or brown, but still separated from the leaves, so that with echolocation they're still easy to pick out. Like here you see them growing straight on the trunk and on the thick branches. Bats also tend to have a good sense of smell, so these figs will also usually have a strong smell when they're ripe in order to help the bats find them. They also tend to be larger and harder, since bats have teeth and can eat piece by piece much more easily than birds can. This is in contrast to figs like this, which are more targeted at birds. See, birds are generally foraging in the daytime, they have a better sense of vision, not much of a sense of smell, so more often you get fruits that are brightly colored without a lot of aroma to them. Here actually you can see tons of immature figs and only a few bright ones because they seem to get picked off pretty quickly. With figs targeted at birds, you're also more likely to get the figs in amongst the leaves because with the color distinction, that's a lot easier to see than it would be at night to bats. Here you don't see that so much, but these, these strings are also a lot easier to perch on for most birds than the trunk of a tree would be. Also, generally, figs targeted at birds will be smaller and softer than the ones for bats will be, because it's just a lot easier for a bird to take a whole fig in a single peck. It's not limited to birds, though. This one is also great for some of the other small mammals around here. Bandicoots particularly like this one. Of course, you'll also find quite a few figs that fit somewhere in the middle, attracting both bats and birds. And I suspect this is one of those. Although, if there's any chiropterologists in the audience, I'd be glad to have their input on that. But here you see traits from both categories. You see small, brightly colored fruits more targeted towards birds, but at the same time they're also born directly on the trunk, which is more towards bats. On the other hand though, you also see all these little knobs here that look kind of like the tree is diseased. But what those actually are is just residual parts from the stems of all these fruits that have grown out over time. It forms these old knobs, and that also kind of gives the birds a bit more of a place to cling to because they can't cling to this smooth bark very well. I like the strings of fruit on that other one, but I think this might be the, my favorite fig that I've found here so far. The dinner plate fig, or kapiak as it's known locally. Now, just looking at it, it the fruit doesn't look very fig-like. It does have this latex that a lot of figs have, but it looks rather more like an artichoke with these scales around the outside. But if you chop it open, you will see the same inner flower shape there with a hole that's just pretty well hidden coming out of the top. Now, I'm not sure if this one caters more towards bats or birds. I couldn't find any information on that, so if you have any information, feel free to comment down below. But this is an important plant for humans here as well. See, it's been cultivated in New Guinea for a long time, and there's quite a few different varieties now. A few of them have pretty good edible fruit, so I'm told anyway. None, we don't have any of those around here. But for most of the varieties, the fruit, it's just not stellar. Something you would eat in times of famine, but no time other than that, really. But the leaves are a pretty popular vegetable. I mean, the old ones will get quite a bit larger than this and stiff like wood, but if you pick the young ones, they're nice and soft and quite edible. They get used in some places for pickling, though not here, really. Other places just boiled or like other types of greens, maybe eaten raw or used to wrap meats, sweet potatoes, things like that. Overall, a pretty good cooked vegetable. The bark of this one is actually pretty useful as well, and it's one of the types of bark that gets used to make tapa cloth, which is what's used for a lot of traditional clothes here in Papua New Guinea. So overall, a pretty nifty plant. So those are a few of the fig species you can find around here. And while most species of ficus out there aren't exactly prime edibles for humans, 
many of them are quite important to someone or something within the ecosystem, whether it's bats, bandicoots, birds, monkeys, you name it. And this diversity of different roles within the ecosystem also shows in the diversity of different forms they take. And there's more than 800 species out here. This is just the ones I found walking around here at the Garoka Natural Habitat. So anyways, as always, if you have any corrections, suggestions, or passing remarks, feel free to comment that down below. And if you enjoyed this video and would like to see more, liking and subscribing always really helps me out. So stay tuned for more interesting tropical plants. Until next time on Ambling with Sam. This video is made on behalf of the Garoka Natural Habitat, a place looking to preserve a slice of Papua New Guinean highland forest for education, research, enjoyment, and to teach people to cultivate honey at the same time. A huge thank you to Kelly e and I for letting me stay here and supporting this project. If you're looking for a great place to volunteer as a researcher, carpenter, teacher, beekeeper, fish pond specialist, mushroom grower, or any of other numerous other specialties, this is a great place to do it.